Hey guys, I'm here today with my colleague and friend, Mike. Today, Mike is going to tell me what he likes about being a bookseller and uh, also get into some of his favorite books and books that have been important to his uh, bookselling career. Mike is one of the best booksellers I've ever worked with. And more than that, I'd say he's also one of the most warm-hearted and kind people I've ever worked with. And I'd go so far as to say that if I went into a bookshop, as a customer, I'd want to interact with someone like Mike. So Mike, what do you enjoy about being a bookseller? Okay, so I became a bookseller uh, about a year and a half ago, roughly. I think mm. it was like September in 2014. Um, I started in the Piccadilly branch. Okay, cool. In Waterstones, uh, and I was a ground floor bod there. Okay, cool. And uh, I think it's the same with most bookshops. The ground floor is like cool new stuff and yeah. like old favorites. Um, the so frothy bit of the shop, as, the we were, frothy, as we were saying yesterday. The frothy <laughs> part of the uh, the book selling latte. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and I've been moved. Uh, I was moved to Trafalgar Square before Christmas. Okay, last cool. Year. And uh, I've been a ground floor bod most of the time then as well. Just working with all the new stuff and like being one of the first people uh, customers interact with when they come through the yeah. door is a really cool thing to be a part of. Yeah, and like it gives you like a much broader like knowledge and understanding of the book world. So that was a good place to You're start. You're on the front lines, man. I'm on the front lines. <laughs> I'm out there doing the heavy lifting. Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful job. Um, it's a fantastic place to be. It's, for one thing, the first thing I'll bring up is just the environment. I mean, like, I hope everyone feels this way about the bookshop they work in or the bookshops they visit, but it's just a very kind of safe, very switched on place that's also quite relaxed. And yeah. it's just, you want to have that enthusiasm in the bookshop, which... Yeah. we definitely try to build on yeah, um, yeah where it's basically like you're just you're given free reign like to like do what you like with this bookshop i mean yeah i mean it could be that our bookshop is more relaxed than others but um yeah it's amazing that you can sort of contribute to that environment that people it's, yeah want to come into and you can like stamp your personality on parts of it which yeah. is great like um so upstairs you can like you can put in a window of something you think is really cool. We've got one up at the moment which is a Harry Potter window. Yeah, I'm really digging the Harry Potter window it's, actually. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um we've got <laughs> two two great booksellers at the moment, Karis and Daphne. They um they went to town on that that window yeah. about a week ago just yeah, yeah. giggling like five year olds hanging up broomsticks and stuff and just like making it yeah like something that they were personally invested in. And then on the other end of that you've got something like um you can just do interesting things. It doesn't have to be all like perennials and like titles that you think need to be canonized yeah, or approved. Yeah. So um, another bookseller, Nat, he's put together this table of like, it's a mixture of fiction and nonfiction. And yeah. it's like landscape books. Like That's books, a really good table. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Books really immersed in yeah. other worlds. And um, it's amazing when you can go into a bookshop and you can find stuff you wouldn't expect. Yeah. Um, and maybe I'm biased because I work in a bookshop, but every time I pass one of those tables, I'm just like, okay, I want that, 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 yeah, that, yeah. that. <laughs> and it makes you want to come back to a bookshop where people think that way and they think outside yeah. the box and they're willing to be creative. Yeah. Um, so I love that. And uh, before I blather on too much again, uh, it's the people as well. Um, but on both sides, it's the, it's the people totally you work with yeah. who are just here. They're just among the most lovely passionate and just bubbly people you can work with because you're just able to bring so much of your personality to the table yeah like stuff that you love like you you can just talk about board games with people even well, though you're that's a bookseller a recent recent hobby of mine <laughs> i've been pushing the board games i'm playing the board games <laughs> yeah i'm playing the board room. games in the staff room yeah well i have to taste test the products you know <laughs> it's, it's, it's market research yeah market is research what it is. <laughs> product it's all for product knowledge sake <laughs> but yeah, it's great that you can do that. And like, you don't strictly need to be sort of like books, books, books all the time. Like, you can mm. bring like kind of, you can talk to people about like, if you're putting together something in the music section or like you, yeah. you're a fan of a particular thing, you can like, you can cross reference stuff. Exactly. And the same with like film and like something as simple as current affairs, you can get on a discussion with someone, yeah. like, especially because we're so close to Whitehall and we've got a big tourist market as it's, well. Yeah, it's kind of like being at a cultural hub. Yeah. Uh, working in a bookstore. Yeah. And sure. you can bring a lot of what you've learned to it. And it surprised me how much of myself I was able to bring into the role. Like, I didn't just have to turn mm. on the book part of my mind. Yeah. I could, like, I could be me as well. You could be, you do you, Mike. I can, you I can, do you. I can be me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's a safe space. And uh, so, yeah, like, the people you work with are great. And the, the customers you interact with, nine times out of ten, 
they're people excited to talk about books. And it's cool that yeah. you can come to a space and we are open and we're open to that. Yeah, yeah. You can just talk to someone and say like, so what have you read lately that you've yeah. loved? Because like, we're not just like cramming recommendations yeah. down throats. We're like, come talk to us about a book you've read that you think is awesome because yeah. we do take it on board. Yeah. And we do, Please. like, if, if you're <laughs> persuasive enough, it might be the next book we buy, yeah. the next thing we get behind. Oh, I'm always um, saying, I'm always saying that to customers, like, you should have my job. Like, cause yeah. you just, you've convinced me that I want this book. <laughs> Some of you are really good. Please yeah, keep yeah. coming back yeah. and uh, we'll keep filling those shelves. <laughs> Okay, cool. So now, uh, would you like to show me a couple of your favorite books? Okay. Uh, as well um, as books um, that somehow, I don't know, I said the theme I gave to you was books that might be important to your bookselling life. Yeah. And so, uh, please show us. I'm very excited to cool. see. So uh, you had the video with lovely Jo. Yes. Um, who's now managing another bookshop. Uh, she had a niche of, like, kids picture books. Yes. Mine is so much more haphazard. I'm like, I'm not that in is a fun. niche. But these are books which kind of, they're important through my bookselling career. These, were these are books about Mike. Books, uh, <laughs> books. Mike books. Not by me, but for me. Oh, um, wow. And the first is uh, one that I didn't show you because I know you, uh, you've read this one. Yeah, right? I love the, this one. The Goldfinch by Donna Tart. Um, beautiful tome. And it was, when I first got a job in Waterstones, <laughs> it was the book I was halfway through. Yeah. So I was reading this while I was first on the beat. Um, Do you want and me to hold it up? If you, yeah, I mean, I'm also intrigued to find out what you think about this book. But um, just in a nutshell, I think Donna Tartt is one of the best people writing today. She's just incredibly detailed mm -hmm. in her writing. Yeah. Um, the first book she wrote was The Secret History, which I think is her most famous problem. Yeah. Because it's had more time to kind of yeah. be recognized as a modern classic. Um, and the line I always use with this one, because I think this one is my favorite of the two. Really? You prefer The Secret History? I think I might do, man. I think that's, I, I think you're in the majority, that's the popular, uh, popular, I think, stance on the matter. I prefer The Goldfinch, though, if I'm being honest. He realized he wasn't in the mainstream. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm just a little bit on the fringe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit on the fringe. If, if we were true hipsters, we'd be all like, no, it's all about The Little Friend. Which is oh, a, which I um, haven't read. Have you book. read The Little Friend? I've not. No, I've no, not. No, but everyone. That. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with The Little Friend. I've heard, I've heard people r run hot and cold. Yeah, I've heard on mixed, that one. Mixed as well. Um, I've heard some good times. Some people have come in and said that it's that it's their favorite. Yeah, so, which is great. There you go. Um, but yeah, The Goldfinch and The Secret History, two very different books. Uh, the line I always use about The Secret History is, uh, it was written in the same year I was born, and it's aged a lot better than I have. <laughs> um, it's it's just fantastic. She just she has such a great line with her writing. Um, yeah. And in this one in particular, she really gets into my jam, which is kind of, I used to love ancient Greek history. Oh, really? And um, the way <laughs> she delves into sort of transposing a Greek tragedy into a modern American setting is uh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's still Daisy Fresh today. Um, and I love this one, but obviously I started with The Goldfinch. And uh, you can see how her writing is changed and refined over the years. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the secret history is kind of like lean, but literary. It, yeah. it runs like a thriller. Um, the Goldfinch is great because she luxuriates in the writing. And luxuriates. It's, it's so great. You can just drink up pages and pages of this book where she's just talking about a single scene yeah. and just doing exposition. And it's something as beautiful as kind of it's, it's primarily set in New York. It kind of hopscotches yeah. around a few places, but the main character that follows Theo Decker, he's kind of, he, he's astray for most of the time through the book. And um, there are just passages in the middle where she's just talking about something as simple as him walking down yeah. New York in the snow. And her sense of perception is just mind blowing. Yeah. Like, the way she can draw that vivid detail out yeah. of the surroundings is so extraordinary. Yeah, um, yeah. Because it's so thick, I couldn't actually pinpoint the passage to read out to you guys. Oh, I would love it. If you find it, please show it to me later. If, if I find it, I will uh, Maybe we'll read we'll, that out. Maybe we'll put it in the quotes if we can find it later on. We put it in the, the we'll, uh, description box. We'll have it in the D-box down the D -box. there. Um, okay. But yeah, and you, you were a big fan. Yes, one, I was a big fan. Yeah, 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 totally. <clears throat> um, you're, 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 you're hitting all, hitting all my boxes. Hitting all the right <laughs> notes. Okay. Um, <laughs> another one now to... Um, shift gears a little bit into uh, graphic novels. This was kind of my craze of last year. I, okay. I read this series, it's a graphic novel series by Brian K. Vaughan, who's I think probably best known for Saga, 
Is works, Brian K. Vaughan the guy who did Saga? Oh, Saga. I didn't realize they were the same person. Yeah, okay. they're the same person. Um, but I think I haven't read Saga yet. I'm gonna dive. Saga's into it really soon. good. I highly recommend. Saga. I've heard it's a uh, it's mint. Yeah. Um, and this one is uh, Why the Last Man, and this is Volume One um, with Brian K. Vaughan and I think it's Pia Guerra. She's the main kind of illustrator through the five volumes. They kind of collaborate with a few others as they go through. Um, but this is just incredible. Um, it's one of my favorite graphic novel series that I've read. It's in five parts, um, over 60 issues. And uh, it's amazing. It starts with kind of a really pulpy premise, kind of something you would hear in the Twilight Zone or something, which is sort of, um, it's set in 2002. And it's, what if every man on the planet, apart from one, suddenly died of a mysterious cause? No one knew what was happening, but they all suddenly dropped dead. Oh and gosh. that's every creature with a, a Y chromosome. Only one of us could survive. Only like one of you us, would, man. You would die. Or I would well, die. Well, I'm actually, I'm, I'm currently, like, suffering from a cold. So this, <laughs> this could be the onset of something. You're, you're going to be last man standing in a bookshop. That's too much pressure. I don't know. Barricaded <laughs> against Trafalgar Square. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it comes up with that really pulpy premise. Um, but the, the thing that's really cool about it is it, um, you come up with this crazy idea, what if all the men died? Um, but then it, like, unpacks really great, in, in a really great way, um, what would realistically happen? If this crazy thing happened, but in the real world, what would happen? So it goes, in the summer of 2002, a plague of unknown origin destroyed every last sperm, fetus, and fully developed mammal with a Y chromosome, with the apparent exception of one young man and his pet, a male capuchin monkey. And uh, <laughs> so you, you read that and you're just like, okay, this is crazy. But then it, it talks about kind of what would realistically be left. So it's like... Um, in the United States alone, more than 95% of all commercial pilots, truck drivers, and ship captains have died, as oh, did 92% wow. of all violent felons. 99% um, of all mechanics, electricians, and construction oh, workers no. are deceased. Um, it goes into kind of the military factions, which have women kind of on, on the team. Yeah. Um, and like, who would be left, what political um, state the world would be in. Okay, that's kind really of who, fascinating. Who's, who's still able to play and how do they pick up the pieces? Oh, that's really fascinating. And, um, okay, that sounds really cool. It's great. It's super pacey and the artwork is just gorgeous and it builds to a really beautiful climax in the last one. Um, yeah, it's just it's just great. Like, you can just get full page spreads like that and it's, yeah. Great, oh, wow. great, great awesome. illustrations. Great, yeah. great fiction. And, um, yeah. yeah. Can't wait Make to check that feel. one out. <laughs> you feel. Um, okay, so this isn't something that I uh, read while I was working as a bookseller. Okay, but it's one. one of your favorites. It's one of my favorites. Let's see it. In my teens, I was a big Stephen King buff. It's a series, kind of. He sees it as his own magnum opus. Yes. And uh, the first book in the series, which is called The Dark Tower, is The Gunslinger. Oh, and wow. And I think last year they came out with these awesome new covers. Yeah, they, if you put them um, like all on the side, right? They make they, like, they, they make they form a, the dark tower. They do, yeah, or some castle thing. It, it comes closer to the the titular tower itself, oh, and wow. um, it's great world building. I think the thing about Stephen King, which a lot of people kind of skim over because they kind of all too readily put him in the horror section, is the fact that he really does build great communities and very immersive worlds. Oh wow! So in his sort of more conventional, I don't really want to use that word, but fiction where he's talking about the real world. Yeah. Um, he will build like towns and villages where you feel like you can feel all the populace yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. gathering and all the interactions, which is awesome. Yeah. And he writes characters who like are very salty and you know, sometimes it's that big swaggering kind of American, you know, like gung ho kind of bravado that these characters are dealing with. <laughs> but um they do feel very organic in the same way. You feel he writes them very, very well. And um he puts a lot of sensitivity into his characters. With the Dark Tower series, he's really... He went gunning for what he wanted to do, is he just wanted to write something big and sprawling. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's seven volumes in this one with a little um, extra kind of mini book, which he wrote afterwards, which goes in between volumes that four That whispers in the keyhole. Uh, wind of, through the keyhole. Wind through the keyhole. Someone felt, someone purchased it last night. Uh, yeah. To find it for them. I, I've still not read that one, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, books one to seven are amazing. And... Oh. Um, what I always tell people about is uh, it's kind of the first book is sort of a Western. He was really inspired by uh, Sergio Leone and he really wanted to kind of access that kind of apocalyptic. Yeah. Kind of, um, like gunslinger world. And um, he does a great job with it. But the first one's quite tricky because the prose is very overreaching in places in a way which is it can be intoxicating, but it can also be quite grating. Yeah. It's um, things like. 
Uh, the desert was the apotheosis of all deserts. Huge, standing to the sky for what looked like eternity in all directions. Kind of like, for some people, that's really going to suck you in. For others, yeah. it's going to be like, what's this guy doing? It's like, Yeah, what do you mean? It sounds... it, people who regularly cry pretension won't enjoy it. But um, I always tell people, stick with the first book, because it gets better as you reread yeah. it. And the second takes a different tone and becomes much more action-packed. It's, oh, really? okay. it's the aliens to this one's alien. Okay, um, there you go. And the whole series is great. Um, it wobbles a bit towards the last few books, but yeah. it, it gets back for the, uh, the end. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a great series. I always rave about this one. Um, so another great uh, run that I'd like to talk about quickly is two books, which I studied at university. Oh wow! Um, which I reread when I became a bookseller and I read more, oh, yeah, yeah, more okay. novels of the author. Yeah, so I've read both first, these. you read *The Bluest Eye*. Yeah, yeah. By Toni Morrison. Um, which I didn't is, know we got this new edition in, actually. Yeah, it I didn't until... It looks really nice. When did this come in? I only knew about it yesterday when I picked up oh, the books cool. for the video. Um, but it's an incredibly sad and incredibly salient novel. It was written in 1970. It's written by Toni Morrison. And um, there's a lot of layers to pick through with this one, but kind of the most prescient one for me is sort of how we use other people... Uh, to make ourselves feel superior, mm -hmm. and kind of, it's about a um, a young black girl in Ohio in the 1930s who's kind of lambasted by the community for being ugly. Yeah. So they they ref they compare themselves to her ugliness yeah. to kind of make themselves feel superior, and um, she spends the, me the most of the novel kind of just wishing that she could be beautiful and so that she could join the community. Yeah. And she wishes that sort of like the catalyst for that would be if she had blue eyes, yeah. she would be accepted. Um, and it's incredibly sad and very moving, but it's so powerful and it's yeah. so relevant still today. So another book that is relevant in a different way is uh, White Noise by Don DeLillo, which was written in the 80s, but I think still sums up a lot of truths about yes. how we live in the 21st yeah, century yeah. now. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you've read this one yeah, yeah, yeah. as well? Okay, cool. Um, I think he's most famous for Underworld, which he did in like yeah. the 1990s. But I think this is his probably one of his most accessible. Yeah. Um, and every time someone picks up like Fight Club or something by Chuck Palahniuk, something along mm. those lines, um, I will recommend White yeah. Noise because it's very much along the same lines. And I think it does it in a funnier and more gripping way. Like, okay. it's, it's a little less abstract, but um, it, it really delves into kind of a theory by Jean Baudrillard to get a bit airy fairy. Um, which uh, is in his writing Simulacra and Simulacrum. And mm. one of the ideas he talks about in that is sort of um, how unreal our world is now. It's, it's <laughs> the notion of the hyperreal, where labels have taken over okay. what they mean. So it's kind of like when you when you have a drink, for instance, yeah. you're, you're drinking the brand. You're not drinking the liquid. Kind of like you're holding Coke because it's Coke. Yeah, you're not okay. holding it as a drink. Um, and this book unpacks a lot oh, of those okay. ideas in a way which is really funny, um, quite morbidly funny in yeah, places. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very deadpan, dry humor, but um, there are bits of it which are just amazing and they really stick out. Like there's a part, I think it's in chapter two, where um, they go to, uh, the main character and his friend go to visit a tourist attraction, which is called uh, the most photographed barn in America. Um, which is famous just because it is the most photographed barn in America. And everyone's <laughs> lining up to take a photo of it to say that they've been to that place. And no one actually knows a thing about the barn itself. It's, oh, wow. And, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think in an age of, like, selfie sticks and things like that, yeah, that yeah. that's an idea which uh, is still... Kind of makes you s stop and pause and think, yeah, this is this is totally ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and that, that novel's great. Yeah. Um, it's a great intro to DeLillo. And uh, he's got another book out this year. Does well. he? Yeah. Okay, um, ooh, I'm excited. I can't remember what it's called, but it's coming out in May. Uh, you can probably yeah. you can probably link away somewhere, yeah, but uh, it uh, looks like it's going to be good. Yeah, it's capturing the absurdity of our time. The absurdity <laughs> of the Western world. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so... What's next? Um, I'm going to go back to graphic novels in this very thinly themed <laughs> discussion. Um, these are just the re-releases of Scott Pilgrim, which yes. are being published... The last one, the fifth one came out just as I started at Waterstones. Okay. The sixth one came out in about May last year. So okay. I kind of, I read them mm. through my book selling time and they are the color editions of Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Oh, We've wow. got the first and the sixth and they're so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, they're so amazing. And Scott Pilgrim is very much 
a series <laughs> where you will either get it and adore it, or you will just be completely bewildered. Um, I think you and me both adore this. Oh, I love it. Adore this series of surrealist, kind of retro, very pop culture influenced adventures yeah. happening to a young Canadian. Um, and the series is amazing. Um, I don't think I need to talk about it that much because it's so well known. There was the film adaptation, which is also wicked. Um, and yeah, the books are amazing, and they're a great sort of hold long... it, hold it to your head, and we look there like we go. They're, they're a great long-winded rite of passage and uh, no, okay, hilarious look well. <laughs> at um, young life, and they're amazing. And as one last thing to bring up, um, the book I'm reading right now was um, bought for me by our manager, one of our managers, Jen. Nice. Um, as a Christmas gift. And I've only just got around to it because I'm a oh, bad wow. man. Yeah, um, I haven't got I haven't got into to Jen's Christmas gift that she got me either. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a worse man. We're then. sorry, Jen. We're sorry. Um, but yeah, Jen is an amazing manager, as is Simon. Um, I'm not trying to be we obsequious. Love both it's, our managers. We, we love you both. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to work in There's an environment like this. smile in my heart. And <laughs> she bought me uh, Our Souls at Night by Kent Haruf, who is an author who died last year. It was, uh, I think he died just after the publication of this book. But uh, I think he knew he was dying as he was writing it. Mm -hmm. It's a very slim book, but it's one which I've savoured over about a week because um, it's one of those books which you don't want to kind of let go. You want to kind of... You want to let the characters creep into your head while you're oh, not reading it. Nice. So kind of like um, you want to savor the experience. Yeah. And uh, it's beautiful. Um, on the back, Peter Carey describes them as beautiful singing sentences. Ooh. And that's exactly what they are. It's, um, it follows two, um, two old people, one man, one woman living in Colorado. Um, they're both um, bereaved. They both um, lost their spouses. And... Um, they start to um, share a bed in the evening, not mm. for sex or anything like that. They just want like someone to be with in bed. Oh. Um, and it goes deeper than that, but it's just... He accesses incredibly simple ideas about humanity that sort of everyone thinks are obvious and they're like, oh, you don't need to tell me that. I've already yeah. heard it before. But he just delivers it in a way which is kind of calm and considered and makes you think, yeah, why don't we think about this more often? Yeah, yeah. Just kind of like... One, uh, one of the basic things, I'll just go into this because it's not a spoiler, is just the way the townsfolk approach the the burgeoning relationship, if you oh, like, okay. of these two people. And it's kind of like they really disapprove because they're sort of like, you know, this is disgusting. You're, he's just a dirty old man. Why is he coming over to your place? Yeah. And it's just kind of like, well, it's my life. Yeah. Like, why, why is it any of your business? And yeah. um, it does it in a way which is so quiet and so beautiful. It's, oh, wow. it's extraordinary. And... Um, you can really, I think it factors into the fact that he was dying at the time and he really, like, he really accessed something personal there for him and he tapped into something really special. And yeah. I'm loving this book. And yeah, it's um, the paperback, I think, is coming out later this year, but the hardback has a lovely cover. It's a lovely hardback. Lovely I really edition. like it. I really like mini books as well. They're yeah. So nice and digestible. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah, there are so many more on the floor here that I could talk about, but I'm not going to because I've talked too much. Um, Is there anything you really wanted to talk about? Um, let's just say this guy. Tell me about always, Jason's giant Always peach. and forever. I, I don't think I need to, just... Okay. Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl. Forever. Yes. He, he has my heart. Yes. Um, so, yeah. You're, you're never too old for James and the Giant Peach. Okay. Um, that, that, that's it. That, that's it. I just want to, like, a little shout out to Raul Dahl for being magic. I mean, um, I'm happy. This is a very happy, pleasurable note to end on. Yeah, I, th I thought end with some color. Don't don't end with a... Don't end with kids. Don't, don't end with a, something a little bit of a downer. End with something oh, like happy. Both so. sound great. I want to read... I'm going to read both next. They're Do it. Fun. So anyways, uh, thank you so much, Mike, for uh, coming and uh, sitting down and talking to me. If you want to talk to me or Mike or check out any of these books, you can uh, come down to Washington Trafalgar Square and have a perusal. Wave. If you like this video, uh, please like it. And if you really like this video, please subscribe. Uh, until next time, happy reading. Bye bye bye. <laughs>